Welcome back, everyone. To Movies About Music. That's right. So this is the second half of our show. And we are going to be talking about the 2022 Oscar nominations. And these have don't necessarily have anything to do with music, movies about music. But it is our Oscar special where we get to talk about the films we want to talk about. Right. And some of them will get into the music aspects. But really, this is just to cover, you know, the year in movies. We are going to skip over some categories because it's impossible to go through all of the Oscar nominees for all of the ca- categories, obviously. So first we have cinematography, mm-hmm. Dune, Greg Fraser, Greg Fraser, Greg Fraser, I'm guessing. Greg Fraser. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Nightmare Alley, Don Lawston, The Power of the Dog, Ari Wegner. Sure. Wegner. We'll, yeah. we'll German him. All right. Or her. <laughs> <laughs> the Tragedy of Macbeth, Bruno Del Banel, West Side Story, Janusz Kaminski. Right. Mm-hmm. I've seen all five of these. I don't know any of these cinematographers except for Janusz Kaminski. Okay. He's done the Spielberg films. He famously did Saving Private Ryan. Mm-hmm. He's a very good cinematographer. Mm-hmm. So I've seen all five of these. Which ones have you seen? I've seen Dune. I saw The Power of the Dog. The Tragedy of Macbeth, and West Side Story. So the only one you didn't see was Nightmare Mm -hmm. Alley. I always try to see the cinematography nominations for Mm -hmm. every year. I don't even need to see the director nominations Mm. or the, you know, best song nominations or best sound or any of that, but I have to see all of the best, the cinematography awarded films, and I did this year. I try to anyway. Just to take a couple of them, Macbeth was really interesting, and the other thing, it's Difficult to separate cinematography from production design. Right. And I'm just going to judge this on camera and lighting and framing and, you know, the work that the cinematographer did, Mm -hmm. blocking. You know, I mean, a lot of this is directing as well. But in terms of pure cinematography, I thought the tragedy of Macbeth was interesting because it felt to me like, I think it's Joel Cohen. It's one of the brothers who Mm -hmm. did this film. Joel, yeah. Yeah. He was doing an homage to Ingmar Bergman. Okay. It was black and white. It was very stark scenically, and it was very much faces and bodies moving in spaces Mm -hmm. that were kind of dreamlike. It was a very dreamlike. I think I really did dream about this film after it was over. I liked the film. In terms of the cinematography, I thought it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. West Side Story, it was fine. Mm -hmm. You know, over the last 10 years, we're starting to see musicals all do the same Mm -hmm. thing, which is this kind of arc camera shot high crane you know moving down to street level and this kind of movement and then lots of takes to give the editor a lot of Mm. stuff i thought it was fine i didn't see anything in the cinematography that really knocked me Mm -hmm. out Mm -hmm. nightmare alley was guillermo del toro Mm -hmm. and for anybody who's familiar with him it's really you know he's very dark he's a very dark Mm -hmm. filmmaker i thought it was a really kind of noirish mm. look. Uh, it was kind of Del Toro's own take on noir. Mm. It looked fantastic. Power of the Dog. I don't understand the nomination here. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Mm. It was a very standard, yeah, well shot film. Yeah, Dune knocked me out. Right, totally. And I know that there's like you know sets and blue screens and stuff like that. But it just the cinematography that the scale. Mm-hmm. You know, the sense of scale, it was a huge looking world mm-hmm. that Greg Frazier helped to make um, mm-hmm. cinematographically. Mm-hmm. And to me, this is the clear winner. Had you read the books? Yeah, I read I read the first yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the thing when Capture. you're reading the books, it is it's the, it is this very imaginative mm-hmm. world that you v- envision in your mind. Mm. You know, of course, there's the David Lynch movie too, which is mm-hmm. a little silly and uh, not very good Lynch film. But this was just stunningly gorgeous and massive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, massive would be the word. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on any of those? I mean, not really. This isn't really something that I think about when I watch movies. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm like the basic person in this conversation. All right. So production design has the exact exact same five nominees. Oh, really? Okay, there we go. All right. Um, I'll read the names. Sure. Yeah. Dune production design, Patrice Vermet, set decoration, Susanna Sipos. Wow. Yeah. Nightmare Alley, production design, Tamara Deverell, set decoration, Shane Vio. Mm, French? Okay. I might be pronouncing a lot of these words wrong. but Just anyway. do them all French. The Power of the Dog, production design, Grant Major, set decoration, Amber Richards, The Tragedy of Macbeth, 
Production design Stéphane Deschamps, Deschamps, or Deschamps. Set decoration Nancy Hay. West Side Story. Production design Adam Stockhausen. Set decoration Rena D'Angelo. I have one thing to say about sure. one yeah, movie. Yeah. The tragedy of Macbeth mm-hmm. reminded me of a Zara home catalog. Okay, so this is the... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about this for set design. It was, it had a very cohesive look. Mm, a Zara home catalog. <laughs> well, it's you know, it's kind of like these. Uh, you know, these. Are you old enough to remember the Obsession for Men commercials or Calvin Klein TV commercials? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so these were ripoffs of Ingmar Bergman stylistic uh, stuff, oh, and it okay. became kind of a parody. And this is kind of you know that that very you know you could imagine like a model going Obsession for Men. Or a Zara home catalog. Yeah, okay. So for you, a Zara home catalog. Yeah, I can see what you mean there. Production design. I got to give it to Dune again. Yes. By a mile. I I don't know. Again, I don't know why West Side Story. We're going to talk about West Side Story later. I don't know why this is in this nomination. It's basically the 1950s. How hard is that? Sorry. Sorry, Adam Stockhausen yeah. and Rena D'Angelo, but we've done this a hundred times. It was, There was nothing uniquely anything that I felt about that. Okay, so film editing. Do Are we moving on? Yeah. Yeah, film editing. Don't look up Hank Corwin, Dune, Joe Walker, King Richard, Pamela Martin, The Power of the Dog, Peter Siberus, Tick, Tick, Boom, Myron Kirstein, and Andrew Weisblum. Yeah, so we, <laughs> we, we saw all of these except for King Richard. Right. Again, I don't know why power the power of the dog is here. It, it, I have two ways of thinking about film editing. I, there, there's two ways of thinking about the award and the skill of film editing. And film editors might not agree with this, but I do teach film editing. There's two things you have to deal with. One is one is time, and one is the cut or the series of cuts and how you cut the film. So you think of a movie like Tick Tick Boom. There's one level at which the action's happening. And then there's this other level at which the action is happening because it's a performance on stage. And then there's almost this third level in some of the musical elements of it. So there's three levels. That's what I mean by kind of how are you dealing with time? There's these three kind of time sequences that you're dealing with. I thought it did it pretty well. I didn't care for that movie very Mm -hmm. much, but I thought it's editing was okay. I thought some of the editing in terms of the performances was a little weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that and that brings me to the idea of cuts. So then right. how do you cut the film? Right. And how is your continuity? Or are you breaking the continuity? Are you doing a Godard-like thing? You mm-hmm. know, a Godard Breathless-like thing? Are you being inventive? Again, Power of the Dog, I don't see why the nomination is here. Dune, I thought it was fine. The film editing was good. And again, it dealt with... It, there's a, It's a linear time with that film. But... It's dealing with half of a novel, which mm. was kind of weird. I, I'm going to kind of push that one to the side. Don't Look Up. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on the editing and Don't Look Up? For I me, mean, it was like someone on Adderall. Well, I liked it. I like the pace of it because oh, yeah? I'm a millennial oh, who's yeah, been yeah, on yeah, Adderall. Right. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I liked it. I thought it was very captivating. A lot of people from my generation on will probably appreciate it. And that's the only mess- the only way to get any kind of content out there <laughs> in this TikTok generation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of frenzied. It was. But it was also, everything was like very impactful. And it was really in your face. And they, the weird thing was they would cut off people's sentences. Yeah. Like someone who has attention deficit issues. Yeah. But I, I agree with you. It kind of lended itself to, yeah, so I would kind of say don't look up or tick, tick, boom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, for mine. Writing, adapted screenplay, CODA, screenplay by Sean Hedder. Uh, Drive My Car, screenplay by Ryusuke Hamaguchi, Takamasa Oe. Dune, a screenplay by John Sfates and Denis Villeneuve and Eric Roth. The Lost Daughter, written by Maggie Gyllenhaal. The Power of the Dog, written by Jane Campion. Okay, I'm going to just do process of elimination for some of these. Um, Again, they're they're all fine films. Power of the Dog, I'm going to... Set aside, we'll talk about that yeah. more later. Dune, again, it's half a book. I'm going to set that to the side. Drive My Car is a three-hour long film, and it's the movie needs to be three hours. Yeah, you told me that. Yeah, it, it's but it's a fantastic three hours. Um, and the way that it's a very patient film, it's also kind of a film within a film. It has a lot of literary references that 
don't seem overly intellectualized. Okay. The writing is really good. Is and it then, adapted from a Murakami Haruki? Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes, from one short story from Murakami, but then with elements of two other short stories. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give it credit for creativity there. All right. And then the lost daughter, which we were both like. Well, I hadn't read the book, so I can't say. <laughs> yeah, but know, we're yeah. just talking about the screenplay. Yeah. Like we can see the screenplay in the film. Uh, this movie deeply traumatized me. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck did I just watch? What we we came up with a new phrase around the apartment, didn't we? Yeah, I fucking I can, Maggie Gyllenhaal. No, I said, what the fuck, Maggie that Gyllenhaal? Yeah. What the fuck, Maggie <laughs> Gyllenhaal? This movie, and it was written by Maggie Gyllenhaal, is so exposed, like an open wound. Um, we can talk. I, I yeah. think it's up for other things. We can talk about that later. Yeah. For me, this is up between Drive My Car and Coda. I want to give it to Drive My Car because it's probably the more, how do I say it, the more creative. I could see that screenplay. But I just love. I just love Coda. Yeah, me and, too. And and we talked about screenplay a lot uh-huh. when we when we did our po- our first half. Everything made sense in oh, the totally. screenplay. It was, it was beautifully yeah. done. I'm going to give it to Coda. I would not be disappointed if Drive My Car won. Okay, sound. Belfast, uh, Denise Yard, uh, Simon Chase, James Mather, and Neve Adiri. Dune, Ma- Mac Ruth. I'm just completely jumbling up these names. <laughs> Mark Mangini, Theo Green, Doug Hemphill, and Ron Bartlett. I like how you made that. Belfast sound. French. Yeah, I know. Because yeah. <laughs> it started with Denise, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I was like, oh, Denise. Bin- oh, never mind. Sorry, everybody, for butchering yeah. your names, but this is how it's going Really be. sorry. I'm really sensitive about these things, and I can't believe I'm doing this. But this is, I'm cold reading all yes, of this. Yes, yes, yes. No Time to Die, Simon Hayes, Olivier Tarney, uh, James Harrison, Paul Massey, and Mark Taylor, The Power of the Dog, Richard Flynn, Robert McKinsey, and Tara Webb. West Side Story, Todd A. Maitland, Gary Rydstrom, Brian Chumney, Andy Nelson, and Sean Murphy. Gary Rydstrom, he always mixes Spielberg's films. He, uh, so he mixed Saving Private Ryan, which won an Oscar for Best Sound. Okay. What's happened this year is they have, they're trying to streamline the Oscars. And so what used to be Best Sound Effects and Best Sound Editing mm. has now merged into one category. Really? And these are two completely totally different, different disciplines. Yeah, yeah, I can even tell you that, and I'm not even a sound person. Yeah, yeah. And, and Hollywood always gets the sound categories wrong. What they do is they, oh, music, let's award it for Best Sound. So I think, me crazy. I think Best Sound, yeah. like, like Bohemian Rhapsody won uh-huh. for Best Sound. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. That's not what sound does they're idiots they're idiots the academy yeah. are idiots when it comes to sound they just hear music and then that's how they judge things and there's been just crimes throughout like sometimes it it works like i think star wars won for best sound what else saving private ryan won for best sound things like this where they really got it right but half the time they get it wrong so i'm setting aside west side story there's nothing in the sound that was notable power yeah. of the dog there's nothing in the sound that's notable. <laughs> I don't know why Power of the Dog is nominated for any of these technical categories. I'm sorry to those people who worked very hard doing the sound. No Time to Die, which we saw, and mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy that movie very I much. I feel very neutral towards it. It was like, Meh. It was a typical Bond yeah. film. In fact, it was almost like a cliche Bond yeah, film. Yeah, I was like, Meh, okay. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was also like almost three hours long. I, I didn't care for that movie very much. And I, there's nothing notable in the sound. It was an action movie. So that's the other thing the Academy does. If there's cars zooming really fast, sound nomination. Yeah, it's like, oh, it must have been really hard to do yeah. that. Meanwhile, yeah. they've got a backlog of library of sound effects that they're just lifting. <laughs> Sorry, sound editors. Uh, so for me, it really comes down to Dune and Belfast. Um, mm-hmm. I thought Belfast sounded beautiful. Yeah, I too. thought there was some very creative sound design. The thing about this movie that I really liked, and I think this should have got a cinematography award uh, mm-hmm. nomination. Yeah, yeah. Everything is from the perspective of the little boy. Yep. Like you see like when these two women are talking and they're watching TV and they cut off right about the boobs, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. he's watching TV yeah. while they're having this dialogue. There's tons of shots like that. It was shot with the eyes in the middle of the frame, which you never do. Mm-hmm. But I think that's how a kid sees the world. Yeah, that's beautiful. And the sound, I think, was the same. It was very dramatic. There were some ways that the sound is almost like a memory so Belfast was great, but it can't beat Dune. Mm-hmm. Dune was incredible, incredible sound design. Well, 
What a world of sound. We also made. watched Dune at one of the okay. really fancy theaters. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Where that should be noted. We got like free sparkling water and chairs that like you know recline recline. and you take off your shoes and put on these little slippers yeah Yeah. we spoiled ourselves on that Uh day didn't we and it had like a surround sound system yeah but yeah in that sense like but oh my god what a world of sound they created yeah so i would be happy if belfast or dune won Mm -hmm. this category but they'll probably give it to west side story because they're idiots (laughs) i mean that would be really funny yeah just watch they will (laughs) visual effects spielberg (laughs) yeah (laughs) Give them the sound. <laughs> Visual effects. Dune, Paul Lambert, Tristan Miles, uh, Brian Connor, and Gerd Nevzer, or Gerd Nevze. <laughs> <laughs> Free guy. We should just do like all the names, once in English and once yeah. in French. Sven Gilberg, or Sven Gilberg. It's probably Sven. Yeah. Brian Grill, Nikos... Kalaitsidis. Oh, good Greek name. Kalaitsidis, yeah. And Dan Sudik. No Time to Die, Charlie Noble, Joel Green, Jonathan Faulkner, and Chris Corbul. Corbould, or Co- Corbu. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Christopher Townsend, um, Joe Farrell, Sean Noel Walker, and Dan Oliver. Spider-Man, No Way Home, Kelly Port, Chris Wagner, Scott Edelstein and Dan Sudik. Visual effects, right? Yeah, it's probably uh, Wegner and Edelstein. Okay, Wegner and Edelstein. Again, process of elimination. Um, this is visual effects. I didn't see Free Guy. You didn't see Mm-mm. it either, right? And No Time to Die. There's nothing in terms of visual <laughs> effects. Why, why great, great, even, yeah. great cinematography, I thought. Yeah. Spider Man was good, It's but it's Marvel, and I feel like we've seen that before. To me, it comes down to Dune and Shang-Chi. And I almost, I, I think I want to give, man, it's really hard because uh, they're both so good, um, so amazing visually. But remember when we saw Shang-Chi in the theater? Again, we saw that. Well, we saw both these movies in the theater. Yeah. Shang-Chi was amazing to look at. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And the landscapes. Yeah, it was a ride. Yeah. It was. But I, I do think I have to give it to Dune. Music, original score, Don't Look Up, Nicholas Brittell. Dune, Hans Zimmer, Encanto, Germain Franco, Parallel Mothers, Alberto Iglesias, The Power of the Dog, Johnny Greenwood. We didn't see Parallel, n- neither of us saw Parallel Mothers. So Johnny Greenwood has been doing all of PTA's films. Okay. The, I, I'm sorry, but I thought the Dune score was amazing. It was okay. like a score this is, score. This is what I'm getting to. <laughs> so my thing with, even though we do a podcast called Movies About Music, film scores... I completely tune out, usually. I'm riding the emotion, and if the score is doing its job, it's supporting me in those emotional lifts and dips and dynamics. I don't tune in on the themes that are going on. I just feel them. So it's hard to talk about them. Power the dog, I don't remember anything. Don't look up, I all I, all I can do is see it. Yeah, I can't hear too. it. Yeah. In Canto, I don't, you know, this isn't music, so I don't remember the the, the score. I don't remember the score. Right. I don't remember the incidental music. I don't right, remember the either. score. Yeah. For me, it's just Dune, and and it's in, by a mile. Yeah. yeah, that was music that I felt and heard. Yeah, Hans Zimmer is a genius. I have some issues with him because I think directors tend to abuse his music. They just mm-hmm. kind of cake over mm-hmm. their films with Hans Zimmer's scores, and I maybe he has an influence on that. But that was. An incredible score. Yeah. There's rare movies where I think I could listen to it with the with the screen off uh-huh, uh-huh. and enjoy it, and this is one of those films. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I could totally see you listening to the score. Yeah. Okay, music original song "Be Alive" from King Richard. Music and lyrics by Dixon and Beyonce Knowles Carter. Uh, Carter. Dos, yeah, Sean Carter is Jay Z's um, yeah. real name. Dos Oruguitas from Encanto, music and lyric by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Down to Joy from Belfast, music and lyric by Van Morrison. No Time to Die from No Time to Die, music and lyric by Billie Eilish and Phineas O'Connell. Phineas, probably? Phineas Phineas O'Connell. That's your brother, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Somehow You Do from Four Good Days, music and lyric by Diane Warren. So we listened to all of these. Yeah, what did you think? I loved Be Alive. Um, mm, I think Beyonce. Beyonce is reaching some levels mm. in her 40s. Yeah, okay. 
I I was I've never been a Beyonce stan. Stan? Yeah, it's like you know you like her no matter what. Like you, mm. you know you defend her on the internet kind of thing. Like a nation Beyonce stan. <laughs> yeah, I've never been, but I'm just kind of like. Oh wow, she's entering new. You know what? Like she's turning. She's starting to sound like an actual artist because, like, the biggest thing that I had with Beyonce is that she doesn't write songs, and so you can kind of hear it. You can kind of hear this, like, almost like a K-pop idol. You know? Yeah. So she just sounded. I don't like, know a lot of her songs. I'm not a fan. I don't. Know yeah, she just sounded a lot like a really good-looking, you know, lead singer from a girl group, which is what she was for a really long time. But now, like, her voice is entering a new. Like Beyonce hmm. era of you know I've lived a okay. life. What about you? I thought it was fine. I thought that the I couldn't avoid like being a little bothered by the production because there was this whole note kind of stab throughout the song. I really liked that. It. You yeah. like that? Yeah. To me, I I thought it was too much. I because the actually some of the it was fairly simple chordal arrangement, but there was also some kind of nice turns yes. quarterly, and then her voice sounded really good and i thought oh this is actually a nice nicely written song but i just didn't like some of the production mm, yeah yeah fair dos oruguitas from encanto what did we think about that that's fine i i thought it the chord progression was very familiar <laughs> this is what i i had a thought when i was listening to uh-huh. it it sounded like they had a lot of corporate people breathing down their necks <laughs> When they were writing the song, and this was probably not the first draft of the song, mm. but it had been watered down oh, to death interesting. Yeah. from a lot of like executives. This happens a lot. Actually. Oh my god, it happens all the time. And then they had to like make it. And in the end, they produced. They ended up producing this song that doesn't sound like anything, but also sounds like everything, and is kind of preachy. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and we're gonna talk about the film. A little bit later. Um, yeah, I I thought it was fine. Nothing. Yeah, it was just like, meh. Yeah. yeah. This is like most the most inoffensive song. Totally. Um, Down to Joy from Belfast, Van Morrison. What did we think about that? Well, I love Van Morrison. Yes, I, I, I know you do. Yeah. I, I adore Van Morrison. And he's been canceled, and I don't care. I will always adore Van Everybody Morrison. Everybody forgot about that cancellation. Did they? It okay. was not that big of a cancellation. It's well, it was just, a pretty big know. cancellation because he wrote a song, yeah, an I mean, anti-vax song. Van Morrison can do no wrong with me, and I really enjoyed the song. I liked it, too. Uh, no Time to Die. What did we think about that? I don't, what did you think? I love the song. I, I actually listened to it like on my own accord for the the first half of... 2020 because this mm. movie's release date got oh, pushed right, back. Right, right. It was supposed to be released in 2020, remember? Yeah, that's right. And so I listened to it a lot. Um I was also doing a lot of like aerial and pole dancing at the time and it was really good for uh that. Mm-hmm. And I love the very lethargic kind of <laughs> Gen Z take <laughs> on the classic bond chords, like the oh, major yeah, okay. the minor major mm, chords mm, and all that. Mm. And I think I always thought that it really balanced off those really chaotic, okay. the, the chaotic chords. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was beautifully oh, written. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was fine. You know how I feel about Billie Eilish. I'm not a fan at all. I don't think there's any movement in her voice. And fine, if the if the kids dig that, more power to them. I just don't like that kind of singing. I agree with, with what you're saying, at least not in the theory way that you understand music, but just in the sense of the it felt like a Bond theme. Oh, yeah, yeah. This would be my my pick to be the favorite me too actually yeah somehow you do from four good days okay so okay music and lyric by diane warren why are you laughing because diane warren man <laughs> <laughs> what is this 1993 <laughs> oh well it's also sung by Re- reba mcintyre yeah. i had the how, can't get more 1993 than that oh my god i mean <laughs> who else do we need like david foster i'm sorry um I was like, man, this is Diane Warren needs to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say. Well, we did talk about it a little bit. Yeah. I thought that the the lyric there are too many words in the verses and it kind of you could feel almost feel Reba McIntyre stretching cuz yeah, she totally. knows she has to fin- finish all these words. And then I just happened to do some YouTubing on it <laughs> to see if this is like a a cover or something. William Shatner, go to YouTube <laughs> Four Good Days, William Shatner, 
He both yeah. does the song better by speaking it mm-hmm. and shaming it at the same time. Yeah, somehow, somehow he reduces, yeah, he somehow it both the song, shame, but also makes it better. And makes it better. <laughs> it's a magical, you know, Shatner, come on, he's sometimes he's just a magical guy. <laughs> he really is. So my pick for this would be, I don't really have one. I, I guess me, Mr. Gen X, I, I love the, the Down to Joy. Uh, my pick would be Billie Eilish. All right. Come on, Billie. Okay, actor All right. in a Getting leading... into the actors and All actresses. Right. The part that everybody cares about. Yeah. Actor in a leading role. Javier, Javier Bardem in Being the Ricardos. Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> Sorry. I have why, a lot to say about his performance in yeah. The Power of the Dog. So do I. Andrew Garfield in Tick, Tick, Boom, Will Smith in King Richard, Denzel Washington in The Tragedy of Macbeth. Okay, so as we get into these actor and actress awards, Mm -hmm. I have to say that I have a bias. Yeah. And that bias is I'm so tired of all of these biopics. Right. So Being the Ricardos is about... um, Oh, uh, I Love Lucy. I Love Lucy. I don't care. Right. King Richard... Will Smith is about the Williams sisters. Right. Great. They're still around. Isn't Serena still playing tennis? Why do we have a biopic on the on the on the Williams sisters? Yeah, I agree. You know, we saw the tra- we listened to the song, the Beyonce song, and it's kind of like a trailer for the film. I feel like I've seen this film without even seeing it. Yeah. I know totally. exactly what's going to happen and I know what Will Smith's performance is going to be. <laughs> Okay, so we have another bias is that we both hate okay, Will Okay, we have Smith. another bias and we'll you can discard our opinion because we have a bias against Will Smith because to me he is just the campiest yeah. person in the world, <laughs> always doing camp. The one movie he did that I liked was 6 Degrees of Separation and uh-huh. that's it. Has he made any other good movies? I don't I can't stand his face. I can't I just can't. I can't. Okay, so yeah. I didn't see the biopics. Okay, so Benedict Cumberbatch, <laughs> go for it. I feel like he did not need to be in this movie. He did not. We was, don't. I thought need it was bad casting. To, yeah. Okay. So we don't need to continuously cast these Brits for very specific American, American rural. Uh, yeah. Yes. Settings. Hollywood, stop it. Especially I agree with you one hundred percent. When they are not good at it, I can understand. Okay, if you his really accent. need Tom Hardy for some shit, what was his? What was his I, Western I don't know. It American was the accent? Most forced bullshit i had ever heard and he was so stiff and weird he was really weird and walking I... around in those strange <laughs> chaps i liked andrew garfield you know in tick tick boom we both kind of did a a diss we did a diss podcast on tick tick boom <laughs> yeah. because neither of us liked it i think you liked it a little bit more than me i just didn't i didn't think it was a very good movie i don't think you're a jonathan larson kind of dude. i'm not yeah but i thought andrew garfield was really good in yeah it. i i thought so too i think he's gonna grow into a fabulous actor. I think he is too. And I would not be upset, even though I thought the movie was poor. I I, I would not be upset if he won for this. What did we think about Denzel? Denzel in in The Tragedy of Macbeth Macbeth was Denzel. Denzel. (laughs) I agree. Not a lot of stretching going on. Uh, And that's fine. He seemed basically annoyed by his own madness, (laughs) which is an interesting take. (laughs) I love Denzel Washington. Me too, yeah. Um, But it it was very Denzel Washington. I agree. Yeah, there's nothing much more to say about that. This is a weird category because we've only seen one movie, but I still want to talk about it. I do too. Yeah. Uh, Actress in a leading role. I want to talk about the nominations, actually, um, because I feel like somehow we have like a 100% white woman. (laughs) Not only that, but three, again, three out of the five nominations Mm -hmm. are biopics. Yeah. Jessica Chastain in The Eyes of Tammy Faye, Olivia Coleman in The Lost Daughter, Penelope Cruz in Parallel Mothers, Nicole Kidman in Being the Ricardos, Kristen Stewart in Spencer. We've only seen The Lost Daughter. Yeah, let's just give it to Olivia Coleman. I thought she was fantastic. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, but I, I just I find it really interesting that they do these things where they would give like they would throw a bone to like a minority actress. Like you know, last year it was like what Yoon Ye Jung for Minari supporting actress. But then this year they threw enough bones last year, and so now they're gonna revert back into what they do, right? I think this nomination is right. 
you know, I don't care. I have no dog yeah. in this fight, but I just find it really, really interesting. Because what about, like, I don't know, there were so many movies. I mean, I don't, I can't really think of any from the top of my head, but uh-huh. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> well, I like all of these actors. I like Jessica Chastain. I think she's great. I think she's right up there as one of the best women working in film yeah. right now. Olivia Coleman, I think, is probably the best woman acting right yeah, now. Yeah. Penelope Cruz, right up there. Nicole Kidman, you know how I feel about Nicole Kidman. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love her, and so do you. Kristen Stewart, I will watch her in a movie just because I find her fascinating. Yeah. So all of these actors I love. Yeah, me too. And I actually, three of my favorite actresses yeah, are in this. Yeah. yeah. But it's just an observation that- Yeah, I totally. To I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. Are we ready to move We're on? ready. Okay. Actor Wait, in a, I want to do a pick. Oh, we no, we can't do a pick. Yeah, because we haven't seen shit. Yeah. Actor in a supporting role: Kieran Hines in Belfast, Troy Kotsur in Coda, Jesse Plemons in The Power of the Dog. Plemons, I think. Plemons. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I know who that is. That's um, Kirsten Dunst's husband. Yes. J.K. Simmons in Being the Ricardos. Cody Smith McPhee in The Power of the Dog. I have my pick right away. Okay, well, we should say we didn't see Being the Ricardos right. and J.K. Simmons. I can't, I can't wash I can't. myself from from whiplash. Yeah, me neither. You have a pick. Yeah, go ahead. I think it's a no brainer. Troy Kutzer in Coda. Ooh, okay. Yeah. I, I have one that I absolutely want to eliminate, other than J.K. Simmons, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that and that's Jesse Plemons. Okay. Yeah. Who is a fine actor. Yeah. He's a great character actor. Love him. Yeah, he did too. nothing yeah. but stand around. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing, there's no agree. development in his character at all. He had to put up with um, Benedict Cumberbatch. Though. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Cody Smith McPhee was an interesting actor. He was the effeminate right. boy. I don't want to spoil it for you, but um, he was fine. He was fine. Kieran Hines, classic supporting actor that would win, you know, kind of a thank you very much award since yeah, he's been yeah. around so long. Uh, I would give it to uh, Troy Kotzer. Yeah. Actress in a supporting role. Mm-hmm. Jessie Buckley in The Lost Daughter. Who who did she play? She was the mother, the younger mother. No, that was Dakota Johnson. The younger mud- mother? With yeah. The... Oh, the younger Olivia In the flashbacks. Oh, okay, the younger okay, okay. Olivia, okay, got it, got Olivia it, got Coleman it, got character. It, got it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Ariana DeBose in West Side Story. That was Anita, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, Judy Dench in Belfast. Kirsten Dunst in The Power of the Dog. Ingenue Ellis. I don't know if that's how you... I don't know who yeah, that is. I think it's pronounced Ingenue Ellis. She's probably either Serena or in Venus. King Richard. Okay. I, that's a guess. I don't know. Okay. So we didn't see that anyway. So we don't... We didn't see King Richard. We yeah. saw the other four. What do you think? Oh, let's see. I'm going to knock off Ariana DeBose. I'm going to knock off Kirsten Dunst. Good. Who just Even though I like Kirsten. her. Yeah, I love she her. Was, she yeah, was, but she, she well, had she did, better performances. Yeah, she's her, had better. Yeah. She, it was kind of, a, I think, a difficult role to play. Mm-hmm. But I agree that it's probably not up there. I wouldn't be surprised at all if she won. I think my pick is Jesse Buckley. Yeah, me too. And, you know, we talked about editing before and two two planes of time going on. I think that The Lost Daughter should have been nominated for Best Editing, and it didn't. That was a fantastically edited film because of the way the times kind of weren't just separate. This is regular time and this is the flashback. The way it times jutted between each other and to help tell the story, that's a really difficult craft. Yeah. And this should have been nominated for Best Editing. I thought she was fantastic. She didn't have a lot of scenes. Mm. But she kind of carried the film in a sense. Totally, yeah. Uh, not, you know, I thought she was equal with Olivia Coleman, mm-hmm. but it was just those two. It's almost like two characters in a film who didn't have any scenes together who both carry the film. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And so I would be really happy if Olivia Coleman and Jesse Buckley both won, as hard as that film was to watch. Uh, directing. Okay, so now we're getting in the, into the two the big, big guns. Ones. Yeah. yeah. Uh, directing Belfast, Kenneth Branagh. Uh, Drive My Car, Rysuke Hamaguchi, Licorice Pizza, Paul Thomas Anderson, The Power of the Dog, Jane Campion, West Side Story, Steven Spielberg. Let's eliminate West Side Story. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's how I think about it. Yes. I would agree with you that West Side Story does not deserve a directing nomination. Mm-hmm. I would agree with you that Jane Campion shouldn't be in the directing category because I think it was a very average film. I think without question, Jane Campion is going to win. And if she doesn't win, Steven Spielberg is going to win. This is my prediction. Okay. That said, that's the politics of Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. 
We didn't see Licorice Pizza. I love PTA. I don't know. that For some reason, that movie didn't grab me. I didn't really want to see it. Belfast. Now, he has a chance to win, too, you know, for the same kind of nostalgic reasons. I think reasons. he should win. I mean, but then nobody. You know what? What I think doesn't matter, but, like, I think if I were to be granting yeah. this award. Okay, so I have two ways of thinking of this. Yeah. For me, it's Belfast or Drive My Car. So it's either yeah. Kenneth Branagh or um, Hamaguchi. Yusuke Hamaguchi. Yeah. yeah. I think the the more artful direction. What? See, I can't even say. I can't even put it in that way. The Drive My Car is a, is a crazy exceptional film. Mm, mm-hmm. And I think that this film should be locked up and put somewhere on a very high pedestal. It's just fantastic. And again, it's three hours but it deserves its three hours. And it's a work of love for this guy, obviously. But I'm kind of with you. I would give it to Belfast. I think that's a- another film where the director's obviously in love with the subject matter and it comes through. And that that kid. Oh, that kid was so adorable. He was so great. That's cheating, casting a kid <laughs> like that. Yeah, he was amazing. He was fantastic. Yeah, it just brought that one. It's kind of like Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. It brought this one neighborhood to life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I thought it was I thought it was great. So I would be happy with either Hamaguchi or Brana winning this award. Okay. Best picture. I never knew what that meant, Dr. Jim Batcher. What? Best picture. What is that award referring to? It is the best movie of the year according to the Academy. So they're awarding the producers? <laughs> yes, because the producers are the money. Okay, got it. Yeah. All right. Classic Hollywood, that's the way it was originally Definitely, done. Definitely, yeah. So back in the old days of filmmaking, the producer was really in charge of the film. Yeah, yeah. And then you would get somebody to direct it and just, you know, bring yes, it to life. Yes. Nowadays, directors have far more power yeah. than producers, but they still give credit. So it's it's a standby of the old Hollywood way, I think. Okay. All right. So best picture, I'm not going to name all the producers. Belfast, Coda, Don't Look Up, Drive My Car, Dune, King Richard, Licorice Pizza, Nightmare Alley, The Power of the Dog, West Side Story. So neither of us has seen King Richard and Licorice Pizza. Right. You've not seen Nightmare Alley and Drive My Car. So looking at these, hmm, what would I be happiest with winning? Or what do I think is the best movie? If it's a matter of the best movie, either Coda or Drive My Car. You know, the thing, let me, let me think of this another way. With each movie I was watching this year, so let us let me just give an assessment of what I think of the movies nominated this year. I think there's a lot of fine films. I don't think this is the strongest year. I think that West Side Story, I don't understand why it was made. Me neither. We watched it, and we, as we were watching it, we were wondering why this movie is being made. <laughs> yes. First of all, the thing that really upset me about this movie, and I couldn't unsee it and I couldn't get into it from there, Mm -hmm. the original West Side Story is fantastic. The scene when the two meet, they again, it's a retelling of Romeo and Juliet. Everybody knows that. They, They meet and they fall in love, love at first sight. The original movie, it's in the dance hall, and they do what musicals are supposed to do. Mm hmm everything falls away and they open up a world within the world. Mm -hmm. That's what musicals do. And they enter into this world oblivious of everybody else. That's why musicals are fantasies. Mm -hmm. And they have a moment together. Right. In Steven Spielberg's vision of a musical, Mm -hmm. they have to go behind the bleachers and separate themselves. Right. Because according to Steven Spielberg, I guess, a musical is a literal thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw that, I just couldn't anymore. And, right. and you know, but I still tried, you know, I just feel like everything was already done and done better in the original. Okay, so confession time. I'm not crazy about the West Side Story to begin with. Oh, okay. I love the music. I listen to the soundtrack a uh-huh. lot, but I'm not crazy about. The I movie like the itself. I like the film because I also like uh, Romeo and Juliet, and I think it's interesting. I would rather watch Romeo and Juliet. Sure. Like I'm not crazy about the the idea of the story itself. Like I feel like this is not the realest of problems based on my understanding of like New York immigrant history. <laughs> Like I was, you know, because I read Mm -hmm. a lot of books about like the early New Yorkers and, you know, different neighborhoods and whatever. And I was just like, "Mm -hmm." 
But anyway, just hypothetically speaking, let's say that that was an actual thing. That serious. I just never really, it was never really interesting to me. But um, I love the the songs, obviously. Beautiful. Mm. And uh, the in the original, the casting was, you know, despite Natalie Wood not being actually Puerto Rican and mm-hmm. all that, like, I felt like it was very convincing. Yeah, I thought she was the good. Chemistry, but yeah. There was the no chemistry. chemistry. That's right. Thank you. There was no... Okay, so this, the, the guy... Mm. Was the guy in Baby Driver? Yeah, I, I like that movie. Yeah, me too. He was terrible in this movie. I'm sorry. No, I there, was, there was just like, why are you here? Zero chemistry <laughs> between the two of them. Yeah, it was just very like blah. Yeah, and what? And Steven Spielberg didn't change anything, right? Like, there's why didn't you create a different setting? Or I don't know. I don't get it. I don't understand it. So that's that. Power of the Dog. Now this is okay. This might get me canceled. Not that I'm worthy of canceling. A bit of history. Brokeback Mountain Mm -hmm. is a fantastic film that should have won Best Picture Mm -hmm. when it was up for Best Picture. I forget what year that was. Instead, the movie Crash won, which which was a pat on the back to Hollywood. And history has not looked kindly on this decision. Brokeback Mountain, fantastic film, should have won. It didn't. Moodlining comes along, and it's a... It's a lesser, to me, it's not as good of a film because, in part, it's derivative. Yeah, yeah. And because it's somehow shocking for black men to be gay, I, you know? Yeah. That one best picture. Now we get to The Power of the Dog, which is the same theme of a, of a manly situation and a repressed homosexuality. Uh. They're going to do it again. I think Power of the Dog is going to win. Okay. And it's not a great movie. It really isn't. Jane Campion is a great director. It was a great, it had like comedic, you know, elements to it in when you think about Benedict Cumberbatch's acting. Yeah, and also just the whole... Because I was laughing at it. Yeah, I was too. It was also just, you could see where this was going. Totally. Nightmare Alley is a fantastic film. And I think that Bradley Cooper should have gotten, he's also a producer on this, I think he should have gotten nominated for Best Actor. Mm -hmm. Okay. He went through a character arc. And it's, you know, again, it's a noirish film, you know, where the the man meets the film fatale and his life falls apart. Yeah, yeah. And his life fell apart. Yeah. And you can see it coming. You can predict the end of the movie. But still, he carries it. And he carries this arc tragically. And his scene at the end, you didn't see it, and I'm not going to spoil it, but he kind of laughs. Uh-huh at the lowest point of his possible existence. And it was beautiful. Well, I think that Bradley Cooper is an amazing actor. I've, he's gotten I've, better There's so better. many yeah. movies where I was like, oh my God, he's amazing. But I don't think he's going to get an Academy Award for really long, for decades yeah, to come so because too. he's hot. And yeah, they he's don't kind of like the Tom Cruise, guys. The, the Tom Cruise yeah. complex. Leonardo DiCaprio deserved an Oscar so many times. True. And like... Because he was hot, like they never right. gave him an Oscar. <laughs> right. So Dune, uh-huh. I feel like is half a movie, um, even though it's an exceptional accomplishment. It's kind of like makes me think of Peter Jackson with the Lord of the Rings films. Yeah. You know, like you can't really single out one of the films. I agree. It's half a film, and it's a beautiful half a film. Don't look up. I I'm conflicted by this film. I know that it's gotten a lot of shit for. Uh, Hollywood press has gotten a lot of shit for oh, really? for the re- for the negative reviews, uh, uh-huh. and people think it's because it's shaming the Hollywood press. Right, right. I'm not sure that's entirely the case. I think it's getting negative reviews because it's a weird movie. Well, I think it was a great Netflix movie. It was a yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's it's a total Netflix movie. Yeah, it's a and great it's, Netflix. And it's movie. a good it's a good Netflix movie. I. Again, when I when I see ideologies coming through a film, I like allegories. You know, like like whatever kind of poetics you're trying to say, whatever try, kind of politics you're trying to say, you should do it poetically. That means it should come through mm-hmm. the film. You should never state your politics. I thought this stated its politics Clearly, too much, yeah. and having all of the good people, the so-called my my. Cousin Kevin calls it the good whites. Having all the good whites sit around the table and have this reckoning Mm -hmm. together. You know, all the scientists, the experts, the Mm know-it-alls was too much. Yeah. Because the world is not divided into two. It's not divided into two. Thank you. And there's this don't look up, don't look down thing that completely played on the divide. People are not divided. They're divided because of things like this that are trying to divide people. 
And it's not, it's much more complex. Than, and people are much more complex. Exa- and people yeah. are more complex, exactly. And in that sense, it was a great Netflix movie. It was kind of like, like Squid Game is a great mm. Netflix series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it a, a grand work of art? I don't think so. Right, like it, I agree. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, Don't Look Up is right up there with Squid Game. Right. Belongs. Whereas Parasite is a great work of art. Yeah, Netflix should have its own award show. It should, yeah, it. like yeah. the MTV Awards. Okay, so my three, and I haven't made any decisions before this, are Belfast, Coda, and Drive My Car. Okay, I feel bad that we didn't watch Licorice Pizza because yeah, I feel I, I like it, we should have. You know, I'm thinking about that now that we should have watched it. And I think it's a subject matter that you and I both like which yeah. is kind of the, i think it's the 90s i'm not quite sure it's 70s, the 70s 70s yeah. we both like the 70s too yeah. but for some reason the premise didn't hit me yeah. at all and it's actors i don't know anything about you know i really don't like movies where there's kids you know who are not trained as actors being actors kind of like um richard linkletter does this all the time well you know i heard the story behind the cast chloe zhao the, does this all yeah. The, yeah go ahead the casting behind um licorice pizza they cast they ended up casting one of the haim sisters i don't know who if you know haim no haim is a band of mm. three sisters um they're great they're one of my favorite bands and i think the guitar player was cast in it mm. she's like the middle sister she's not even like the most popular haim sister Um, Because I think Danielle, the lead singer, guitar player, and the bass player sister is really popular because the bass player sister has like a very outrageous bass face. But anyway, that's Mm, another topic. But (laughs) I heard that they casted her because they couldn't find a real 70s face in the industry because a lot of actresses have had plastic surgery. Oh, interesting. And they wanted a natural 70s face. Okay. But it's impossible at this moment in Hollywood to find a natural face. And he was gung-ho on finding a natural okay. 70s face. Mm. No Botox, no fillers, yeah. no plastic surgery, no fake teeth even. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why she was casted. Oh, okay. So I, I was interested in seeing this movie. Well, maybe we'll watch it. Yeah, And yeah. then maybe on our next podcast, we'll um, give a nod to it. So yeah, for me, it's Belfast, Coda, or Drive My Car. So I'm going to go with Coda. Okay. Because that movie, I, with all of my heart, love. Me too. Yeah. If I, okay. I, I loved Belfast too. I did too. But I have to say Coda made me feel things. Yeah. It made is, me feel all of the feelings. Yeah. And I don't feel a lot of feelings nowadays. <laughs> I think Coda, I think it has a chance to win. It's interesting because it's an Apple production, you know, like streaming mm-hmm, services mm-hmm. are starting to get more and more... There's still a like a negative attitude about Netflix. Yeah. I think people are more amenable to Apple and they're buying up content like crazy. They've got all the money in the world. They bought this film outright and distributed it. Good for them. But this is a movie that I think will touch people deeply. Try to keep yourself ignorant of this film before going into it. So I guess that kind of brings us around to the beginning of our podcast. Yep. Is is I loved coda and you did too and it's just a fantastic film and i think it's just what cinema is all about yeah and I it's agree. a great movie about music so that's kind of my take all right movies about music i do want to mention one other thing we saw one of the documentary films oh yeah and we both loved it oh summer of soul or when the revolution could not be televised. Name the producers. Okay, Amir Questlove Thompson, Joseph Patel, Robert Fivolent, Fivolent, and David Dinerstein. Oh my God, we were transfixed. We were. We were both. I was like, damn, I would have really liked to have lived in the 60s. 69? 69. Yeah, it was 69, yeah. right. The year I was born. Yeah. And I was like, oh man. Yeah, because you liked all the clothes and all I the, loved uh, the clothes and the music. Oh, the music was like, so good. That's my jam. Yeah. I was like... And it was like real gospel. Like, to give you the, the idea, everybody knows about Woodstock. That same year, there was another concert that was given in Central Park in New York. No, in Harlem. Sorry. Marcus Gravy Park in Harlem. Okay. But right there, you've got the idea of... Now, it's not all white performers at Woodstock, but... You've got a mostly white show going on that has lived on in history. You've got a pretty much all black concert. It was a celebration of being black. It was a celebration yeah, of yeah. being black that was not 
part of history. And this is, without even saying it, you can know it in your own mind, this is what history has done to black people. Totally, yeah. And so on that level, you've got that. And again, what I was saying, don't force your politics by explaining it. Mm -hmm. It did it perfectly because it showed the beauty of this music. Totally. And the beautiful concert that this was well you know what they didn't need to explain any of it no they didn't that's the what i'm music saying and everything else that's like exactly it spoke for itself like you yep. didn't need to say shit yep. you can clearly see what happened that said yeah. there yeah. was a lot there was some fiery political statements that some people said and was it nina simone oh nina simone recited a poem by i forgot who but you cannot was, say that shit today yeah, yeah she could i mean you could tell that they were feeling their power in that moment and it, and yeah. it was great she could not have said that today. But they Nobody had like, could say what she said today. Well, yeah, yeah. They had Black Panther. Um, yeah, the Black Panther was running security. Yeah, it was running security. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh man, I just love because I love the radicalism of it. Oh, oh my it God. was. It, yeah, so it good. was. It made me feel all all the feels. Yeah. I was like, man, we, we have devolved it. as a species. <laughs> Well, it, it, it's just this, I love that, you know, there's this idea of deviant art and, yeah. and um, art that expresses things that are not politically correct. And they were doing it on that day. Yeah. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was the, the energy was right. Mm-hmm. People mm-hmm. were having a good time, but people were also like, you know, there was some shit going on back then. And yeah, you could feel it as an outpouring. Totally. And they were really happy to be there, excited but there was also like a a celebration togetherness community yeah. yeah and now people are getting trampled on at Travis Scott concerts mm. <laughs> and that's just it makes me really sad where is this world gone yeah and i'm just like the the saddest part about the Travis Scott concert i'm sorry i'm going to have to bring this up because this was the most disturbing thing that has happened in music to me he has a lot of followers and he has a reputation apparently of inciting violence during his concerts, like telling his um, fans to beat people up and like, you know, whatever. And then at this concert, Astroworld or whatever, there were deaths with like the crowd like moved too quickly. And he was like, you know, encouraging them to like step over people and like I did hear about this. Yeah. yeah. And people were dying and he still continued to perform. What I'm concerned about is like how... (laughs) Art and music has devolved to the point where all these people were going to see fucking Travis Scott. And I was like, and when I saw Summer of Soul, I was like, you know, they were pushing to see like, who was it? The singer from The Temptations, he was really popular, you know, and he could sing. Oh, my God. But then nobody like, you know, was trying to kill anybody. Right. You know, like it right. wasn't the and then they were like, oh, you know, you need to you guys need to settle down. We cannot continue this performance because they were getting riled up. Yeah. If in a you good continue, way. Yeah. And I was like, see, that's how it. there were more people there than there were at fucking Astroworld for Travis Scott. And I was like, see, like people knew how to like do things back then. I don't think there's a sense of community in, in shows today. Dude, we are devolving as a species like mm. like nobody's business. Yeah. Like this is going to a very dark place. Mm -hmm. Watch this documentary, Mm -hmm. please, to see how we could be living if we get ourselves off of this bullshit. Totally. Because this could, it's not like we can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. We choose not to. Mm -hmm. We could could be out in a park enjoying good music. Yeah, right, exactly. (laughs) That's all I'm going to (laughs) say. Okay. I also want to say, you know, I think Questlove... uh, did a lot of work like digging up these tapes. Um, I don't think yeah. that they were readily available. He had to do a lot of work. And and the the restoration that they did looked great. Oh. It sounded great. Whoever shot it and whoever did the audio recording, oh, man. kudos to you because yeah. it sounded it sounds great. It looks great. Just a fantastic film. We didn't see any of the short subject documentaries. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about the international feature films because I only saw one of them. We could end up with animated feature film and talk about <laughs> Encanto, Encanto, yeah. in, in and Raya and the Last Dragon. Well, you got into trouble on social media because you said something about Encanto that was the story made no sense to me. The story made no <laughs> sense to me. So you've got this family who is apparently like a cartel, 
and I'm not being racist by saying that. There are I family. Said that. Yeah, I was you like, did. this is clearly a cartel. Yeah, this is like it's is this an like allegory. A, an allegory for for drug cartels? It's a family with massive power in in the yeah, in, in the, the community. In the community. <laughs> Living, and the community living looks to this family. Total privilege. Yeah. They've got all the magic. They have all they've hoarded all of the magic. And the community looks to them to provide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but then what happens? You there was what? a di- misunderstanding? There was okay, so I Somebody didn't give the love to the kid. Uh, the one no, okay. Come on, stop it. One of the Serious? girls, yeah, one of the, 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 there are a lot of kids, right? There's like Isabella, who's like, you know, a flowery magic girl, and, like, <sighs> and Louisa, who's really strong, and like, mm-hmm. you know, they all have magical powers, like, right? One of them, she is the only person who somehow, you know, doesn't have any sort of powers whatsoever, but she's really devoted to her family. And so she goes out of her way constantly to prove that she belongs in the family. Right. And that she can be of use. Which right? is a which is a common setup for Disney films and it's fine. I would say that this is the most common storyline in Asian whatever, in Asian folklore. The child who is not bringing honor to her family oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is the most, there's the perennial theme of all Asian folklore. So I was like, at first I was delighted to see this in, in another cultural context. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, we're not so different after all. And so there was like a lot of songs and dances about their magical powers yes. and how they use them and whatever. And she had a song and dance about how she's okay with not having any. And then somehow the power dries up, but then she is like the grandmother and all the, the rest of the family somehow ends it ends up thanking her for... For like, what? For, you know, making them realize what's truly important. Because Which is now what? that they have... No power. It's family is important, right? Family is important. Mm, I think that's what the, they were trying to but say. But they already had family. It's just that they kicked one of them out. Or she left voluntarily. No, they the, never the, the guy who was buried oh, in no, the He in left the voluntarily okay. too. He disappeared because he thought that he was damaging the family or whatever. Okay. Anyway, none of this was <laughs> super ask. clear. Yeah. Yeah. None of the story it's arc a was film. not. Really, it's an animated film. Yeah, it 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 wasn't, and it on obviously they had decided what the moral was going to be before they wrote this. Which movie, is what? Which is um. I think the moral of the film is all you need to do is talk about your feelings. Yes, I think I agree with you. You're not wrong. I don't know. Yeah, communication and like knowing what's important in life, and it's not you know what you have so if you're a 12 year old girl like this character is 15 years old no actually the moral the morality the moral of this story is this i think this is what they were going for you are valuable no yeah. matter what right you are of this, equal but this value. is where i thought it was gonna go and that's a better message I thought she was going to, you know, go on this hero's journey where she overcomes and shows everybody Mm -hmm. that they don't need the magic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Instead, it turned into this really lame, Mm -hmm. cinematically grinding conversation. Mm -hmm. The film ground to a halt for them to have this conversation about a misunderstanding or something. I'm not quite sure. I thought it was going to be about the girl showing them that they don't need this power, that they don't need this magic, that the power is in the love they have for each other. But no, they go and they rebuild everything with their bare hands and blah, 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 blah. And then magically, the magic returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the problem with the movie. Actually, now that I'm like recounting what I saw, I don't even know what we watched. I don't know what this movie is supposed to say. Yeah, what was that? And for me, like just on a technicality note, the sound was really weird. I felt like when they were singing, there were a lot of lyrics, right? I'm gonna 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 and then you know that I don't have magic, but my sister Isabella has really a lot of magic and then I'm gonna go to the market. And but then you can't hear this over the music. And we tried yeah. to turn it up and it was too loud, yeah. but you couldn't hear any what you couldn't understand what anybody was saying. I couldn't saying. understand what anybody was and saying. And it's not like I have any trouble understanding Spanish accents or Colombian accents. Like I have no a lot of my friends have like thicker, like way thicker mm-hmm. <laughs> Spanish accents. But I was like, what is she saying? And there was like a really nasally voice acting thing going on with the main character. True. Yeah, I remember yeah. you mentioning that. She is a full adult. Mm-hmm. She's um, the actress in Brooklyn 99. But anyway, 
she's, I think and she's in her 30s, like she's well into her 30s and she okay. was playing a teenager. And I think her idea of a teenager is like a really nasally, like, you know, like yeah, my voice right. is really underdeveloped and I sound kind of like a pubescent boy. And she just ran with it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, dude, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. So let's compare that to Raya and the Last Dragon. We love this movie. Mm-hmm. That was a great movie. It's so long since we've seen it. I, I'm sure Encanto is going to win this category. Yeah, probably. I have no doubt. I mean, I haven't seen Flea, uh, Lusa, or Lucha, and the Mitchells versus the Machines. I haven't seen any of those movies. But I would like to see Rhea and the Last Dragon win. I thought that was fantastic. It was this beautiful, mythical mm-hmm. journey, great characters, funny, yeah, beautiful. There was an arc to it. They got into trouble for two things. Um, the amalgamation of Southeast Asian cultures. That's true. That's right. Second, the casting of mostly Northeast Asian American that's right. voice actors both of those to play Southeast Asian. But it's characters. a fantasy. I, I didn't thought it was think creative. That, you know, I didn't think yeah. there were any barbaric depictions of a certain... No, you know, yeah. not at all. Nobody was negatively yeah. represented. But for me, it's like, I'm just going to have to defend Aquafina. Who okay. played the dragon. Yeah, so she's... Um, she's half Korean, half Chinese. She sure is peppy. From Queens. She's Nora from Queens. Like, she has a show called Nora from Queens. I love Aquafina, and I hate to sound like a hipster, but I have known about her since 2011 during her YouTube rap days. Like, she's a joke. Like, she's a comedy rapper. And I thought that her voice is just so distinct and she, she her comedic very timing voice. is just yeah, unparalleled true. and she was in Shang-Chi too and I felt That's like right. everything she touches turns into gold like you know and I think Aquafina only Aquafina could have like embodied the dragon like mm-hmm. I just really liked the energy that that brought in mm-hmm. it was really cute the yeah. dragon Loki looked like Aquafina <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> and it was just very entertaining mm-hmm. I agree all right, so that's it. Sorry we did not get to the short film, animation, short film, live action. We didn't see any of them. We don't have an opinion. Yeah, documentary short subject. There's one I want to see called Audible mm-hmm. that is on Netflix, I believe. I'll try to see that. But I just couldn't get, we, we couldn't get to all of these. So that is that. And I hope you've enjoyed this totally free form movement Ramble through fest. the, yeah, yeah, Ramble Fest through the Oscars. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next time. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song So you'd magically feel a love that's alone Hopefully, they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Poets and sadness and war Of immeasurable pain Unconditional